Uh, thank you for your patience. My name, in case you don't know, is Vijay Iyer. I'm the I'm a professor of music here at Harvard and one of the co-organizers of this gathering. Um, I don't need to introduce the whole gathering. I think most of you have been here for the last day or at least this morning. Um, but I would like to introduce these uh, incredible musicians. Uh, this panel is called Jerry Allen and the Experimental. And part of what we're going to be doing is interrogating that category, trying to maybe um, figure out if we're on board with it as a useful tag or whether it describes something that is um, of interest to us or whether we find it instead to be um, a bit limiting in its own way. But also in what ways we could view Jerry Allen as either capital E or lowercase e, experimental musician, um, as part of our ongoing celebration and collective inquiry into the legacy of Jerry Allen. So I'd like to introduce our incredible panelists here. Um, to my far left is a legendary saxophonist and composer uh, named Oliver Lake. He, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, he's, uh, he's from St. Louis. He's one of the founders of the Black Artist Group from St. Louis, which um, uh, was similar to the AACM in Chicago, a collective of, shall we say, experimental African-American musicians uh, in what was at the time a de facto segregated city. Um, uh, there, it was their project of building uh, their own institutions, building their own support system for creativity across disciplines um, that included music and dance and poetry and visual art. And Mr. Lake has been a part of uh, all of that. Uh, and I love this um, list of his collaborators. The Brooklyn Philharmonic, Flux String Quartet, Bjork, Lou Reed, A Tribe Called Quest, most Def and Michelle and Degio Cello. Um, and he was one of the founding members of the World Saxophone Quartet. Uh, and I had the pleasure of working with him in a long standing project that he has with Reggie Workman and Andrew Cyril called Trio Three. That group did a series of albums with guest pianists. Um, one of them was Irene Schweitzer from Germany, or from Switzerland. Another was Jerry uh, Allen, <laughs> Jerry Allen herself. Another was Jason Moran, and most recently I did one with them a few years back. Uh, and so I guess we can say that Mr. Lake has been active as an intergenerational artist who's fostered collaborations across disciplines, across genres, across communities, boundaries, in a way that, um, to me, you could call experimental, but it never feels like an experiment. It always feels like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so, so Oliver Lake. Oliver Lake. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Chris Davis, who was here at the concert yesterday? You all heard, you got a good dose of this incredible and virtuoso experimental pianist. I mean, she's uh, really bringing new life to the art form of creative music at, from the piano. Um, I mentioned yesterday in our piano-oriented panel that she reminds me of Jerry in the way that she heeds no boundaries <laughs> and uh, keeps pushing, keeps exploring. And uh, you should all check out her recordings under her name and also collaborative projects with Mike Formanek, Eric Rivas, and um, Tyshawn Sori. Uh, who else? And now Terry Lynn, right? Terry Lynn and yeah. John Zorn. And Zorn, yes, indeed. So you also kind of um, move across uh, what are conventionally seen as separate scenes, would you say? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Well, I wanted to. I just. I'm, you don't have to answer. But um, <laughs> I thought we would start by maybe. I 
wanted to ask each of you what, whether this word experimental is a useful term for either of you in what you do. Well, it's all one thing for me. I have a, a model that I've used as my philosophy throughout my career. Put all my food on the same plate, <laughs> which refers to the fact that everything is the same for me. Whether I'm painting or composing for string quartet or writing for Trio 3 or writing for my big band, it's all one creative well that I'm going to. And uh, for me, I never think of it as experimentation. I think of it as me, my creative creativity coming to life. And whatever I'm attracted to, I've been fortunate enough to, to see it come to fruition. Hmm. Yeah. And for me, um I mean, everything's kind of experimental, whether I'm playing, you know, I mean, that's sort of the same that Oliver is saying that um, whatever I'm attracted to, I, you know, research and learn about it and try to incorporate it into some kind of project um, with people that I want to work with. And, um, you know, there's no, there's no limit on that for me, you know, and I'm interested in putting people in positions that they're maybe not usually found in um, to see what can happen. So it's, you know, every project for me is an experiment. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> I, I often describe it that way in, in most interviews. Um, so. so it sounds like um, both of you are saying that um, the, the span and the, the work of creativity is, um, is about always making something new. Um, so would you say that maybe that's a better term? I mean, I know that, for example, the phrase creative music has been applied maybe as a, a, a kind of counterweight to the word jazz, mm -hmm. as a kind of uh, perhaps a more accurate description of what's happening, something that maybe tells you something about what's happening, that the creative process is involved at the moment of performance, for example, or that there's... Um, a sense of aspiration and exploration. Uh, does that seem, I mean, I guess maybe another way to put it is, what if we suggested that jazz was always experimental music? Is that a fair? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yes, expanding the boundaries is what a lot of the great players have always done. Mm. Miles Davis put his trumpet sound surrounded by different colors throughout his career. He changed from electric instruments and uh, acoustic instruments, the muted sound, the orchestra, and Richard Mulhall Abrams mm. followed that path. I followed that path. Julius Hemphill followed that path. So it's about expanding and growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe from that standpoint, now that that kind of uh, sets the tone uh, or for our understanding of this music to begin with, um, Mr. Lake, I was wondering if you could tell us about your relationship with Jerry Allen, because I know it spans some decades. Yes, I met Jerry in the 80s. She moved from Detroit to New York. And her first gig in New York was with my band, Jump Up. I had a band that played reggae and funk, and it was called Jump Up. And she, uh, when she moved to New York from Detroit, that was the first gig she had, was with my group. And that started our relationship. She's recorded with Trio 3 several times. She recorded with my quartet, with my quintet. Mm. She hired me for various projects that she was doing. And that was from early 80s up until her passing. We continued a relationship. And the fact that Jerry was always open to anything that we, we did musically. Mm -hmm. How did she strike you as a pianist? What, um, what do you remember about her? She, she was limitless, boundless. Anything that was in front of her, she would go for it. 
And that was exciting about it, about what she did. She was inside and outside. Mm. <clears throat> was that, so how did she function then in the context of, you described Jump Up as, your, as a reggae and funk band. So uh, <laughs> She got right in the pocket with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that was what was exciting to me about meeting her. The fact that she, anywhere we wanted to go musically, she was right there with us and was ready for it. Um, I was checking out one of her interviews and she was talking about um, when she first moved to New York and that you hired her for her first record date. How did you, I'm curious about the, the timeline of that. Did you meet her in Detroit? Um, or when, when did you meet her? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was in New York. My friend, uh, Faron Aklaf, who was from Detroit, mm -hmm. had told me about Jerry, and I think he introduced us when she got to New York. I didn't meet her in, in Detroit. I think my first meeting, but I had heard about her from Faron Aklaf. And after first hearing her, he was telling me, this is who you should hire. And when I heard her, that's what, what I did. So she played with Jump Up, and then you recorded the album? No, she didn't record the Jump Up album. She recorded another album with me. Okay. But, but she did some gigs with me with Jump Up. Okay. And what was the album she recorded with you? Oh, <laughs> it may have been Expandable Language. That was one okay. of them she did with me. Yeah, yeah. There were several, and I'm not remembering the titles of every one of them, but yeah. that one comes to mind. That was in the 80s. Maybe we could listen to... Yeah, I'm well, I was to, listening to that this morning. I'm trying to pull it up at this moment, but I am not... It's taking a second to get online. But, uh, <laughs> but what struck you about it? Well, I, she just... I, I think what Oliver's saying is true. She just is limitless and you know would go for anything and it seemed especially at that time um, and she would bring a lot of creativity to everything mm -hmm. whether it was funk or blues or playing experimentally or playing so-called avant-garde or playing in the pocket everywhere we you wanted to go she was right with you yeah mm -hmm. And it seemed like it wasn't a, a bag she just loved that music and she was playing from her what she loved from her heart, heart. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was not title again of that one? That record, expandable language. Yes, right, right. I have a short story about one of the recording sessions we did. She came to the to the recording session with Wallace, who was about two months old, mm. on her baby pouch in the front there, mm -hmm. and. I said, Jerry, you brought your baby to the recording session? You didn't? She said, I couldn't, get a, I couldn't get a babysitter. Yeah. She said, but he'll be cool. He's used to this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so she recorded the entire album with him on her stomach. <laughs> didn't make a sound. Are you serious? That's impressive. I believe it. Wow. I believe it. Well, here is um, <clears throat> the title piece from Expandable Language with uh, Firon Akhlaf on drums, Fred Hopkins, Kevin Eubanks on the guitar. Uh, that's not me. I don't know what that is. That's, that might be you. Is that possible? Oh, I see. I'm sorry. It was me. I have too many tabs open. You know how it is. Sorry, which one? Oh. C-O-M-O-U-S. How would you? Comus. Comus. All right. Thank you. 
<laughs> That's Oliver Lake from 1985. Um, you know, listening to that, I was reminded of um, some of Roscoe Mitchell's music and some of the thinking behind it. Uh, um, yesterday we listened to a bit of um, Jerry Allen playing with Ornette Coleman and his band from the late 90s. And there's a similar sensibility, which is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of activity, but it doesn't build, it doesn't cluster or kind of collide. It's more like a kind of, it's contrapuntal, essentially. There's a transparency, so you can kind of hear all the way through, and you can hear each individual element, even as the kind of velocity of notes seems to... Well, um, we were always trying to have a conversation. Yeah. And that's throughout my history and our history as, as creative musicians, when we improvise, we're using the notes 
as words mm. and having a conversation and making a communication and trying to make that communication complete. Mm. Uh, and there's also, a, it's, it's words, but then there's a simultaneity happening too. So it's also kind of like dance or something in the sense that there's the, the way that um, you hear motion, you know, you hear, you hear uh, bodies moving in, in a way that um, is meaningful, you know, in its own way. It's, it, uh, I guess in the sense of conversation, we think of listening in, in an exchange, that's sort of back and forth. But here what we have is something more sustained that um, so I, I think of both of those metaphors as, as helpful in my understanding um, music like this which some people would categorize as experimental um, what did you I mean do you have any thoughts about the way she's playing I mean you, you're the one who chose this track so I was wondering if you had a I, I, I just I really love the way that she accompanies you I mean it, I know it's it's a conversation but you know, sustaining that kind of level and energy, like what you're saying, you know, there's, there's um, something uh, just deeply understood about the music that we can sustain it, you know, we can exist in this, uh, this high level of energy and we can still hear what's going on and have a conversation at that level and sustain it for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I love how she paints, you know, with the piano. There's, there's a, you know, as piano players, we want to play chords and, you know, she, she's more fluid mm -hmm. in this than, um, I don't know, maybe some of her later works mm -hmm. <laughs> where she got more, you know, sort of harmonic or chord based. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this, this for me, she's a real painter in this one. So yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. She was a painter. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, I hear these strokes, like these broad sweeps of the arm, <coughs> and these, um, it's gestural in that sense that we, that we see in painting. You see the, the mark of the hand as well as the image that's being represented, right? Uh, the, uh, you know, the, something that's come up kind of, or that's been in the background here is that uh, I think of all of you guys from BAG uh, and all the guys from the A, all the folks from the AACM um, from St. Louis and Chicago, respectively, and they're all of your incursion into New York City in the 70s. Is, and then I think of Jerry Allen coming from Detroit as part of another wave of that, that there's, there's actually a kind of Midwestern regional experimentalism happening that maybe we could put Detroit in that mix as well. Does that, have, does that hold any water as a... Yes, we were in communication with musicians in Detroit at the time that the Black Artist Group was in, in, in uh, effect. And when I moved to New York, I was in... I mentioned Faron Akloff, who was from Detroit, and then I, uh, Spencer Barefield, guitarist from Detroit, had a, a cooperative music group there as well. Mm -hmm. And he was doing some similar things to the ACM and the Black Artist Group. And we uh, kept a connection with those musicians as well. Uh, the violinist from Detroit. Uh, Regina? Regina. Regina Carter. Regi Regina Carter. We played together extensively, and she, we, I worked with her band, and she worked with my band several times. But the Detroit, St. Louis, Chicago connection, the Midwest connection is very strong. And that's a particularly, um, it's interesting because, for one thing, it's a counter narrative to the coastal, you know, to like New York being the center, or even West Coast at Los Angeles but also to New Orleans being this, uh, another center. Because, you know, the black communities in the Midwest uh, are the result of the Great Migration, right? So there's uh, several decades in between leaving the South and then um, basically the period that we're talking about that where a, a certain kind of 
um, identity is being formed, it seems to me. And that's, uh, so I'm, I'm trying my, for myself to make sense of all these relationships that um, kind of get subsumed when we use these larger categorical names like jazz or experimental or avant-garde or something like that, that actually there are these multiple historical strands that, sweep, that span a century. And, um, and that, that they're sort of speaking through these encounters that are happening in the 70s and 80s among all of you. Um, does that hold water as an idea? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a part of what was happening. The communication was open between the AACM and the Black Artist Group and the groups, uh, even the groups in California. Uh, Arthur right. Blythe and David Murray came from California and they were part of... Uh, uh, Horace Tapscott. Horace Tapscott's group. So we were aware of those groups and knew that we were all say, searching or trying to make, take the music to the next level or to move the music forward mm -hmm. and do it in the context of it being organized. And that was one of the things that excited me when I went to Chicago and saw the AACM and saw that they were organized and presenting themselves and uh, teaching lessons and being in control of their destiny. And that was one of the things that the Midwest was doing with the Black Artist Group, the group in Detroit, the group in California. Yeah. I think it's interesting to read this as successive waves of migration among African Americans um, in the 20th century coming from the South. I mean, we associate, for example, Monk and Coltrane as, uh, you know, they're Southerners, like they come from North Carolina. Um, they come at, to New York earlier in the 30s and 40s, for example. But then if we at, look at successive waves, I count, um, you know, it's detailed in George Lewis's book about the AACM and in Ben Looker's book about Black Artist Group. That, um, that, you know, these sources, these historical connections to the South, and then the way that identities were formed in the context of these northern cities, um, pre-civil rights era kind of uh, um, historical moments and, you know, spanning across the civil rights era. And then looking at these, and, and that included the black community in Los Angeles, too, as another pole of the Great Migration. But you know, also thinking about Jerry Allen, the blues was very prevalent in everything that she did. Yes. And th I feel that was going through all the music that I make on my saxophone. The blues is going through there, whether I'm playing with a string quartet or playing solo, mm. the blues is, is a strain that's going through that. And that was very true with Jerry's music. Right, that, actually someone said that on the previous panel too. I think it was done, <laughs> so it's, I think there's a consensus <laughs> about that. Uh, and so it's um, interesting to, uh, so how does that, for example, um, when you say that, uh, could you speak in more detail about how we might hear it in a piece like what we just heard? What, what about it for you? I mean, it's, it's hard to put into words, I imagine. It is definitely hard to put into words. It's, it's the sound that's there, and you, and you know it, and you hear it, and you feel it. Well, I heard it in the, the vocal, like, cries of the saxophone and the guitar. Um, well, I also heard it in the, uh, the, in the edge that it has, the whole, th the, um, it's not just about m being pretty. Or something. It's about something a little bit more um, real, right? It's kind of about an aesthetic of realness. Or um, well, when the communication is is true and it's coming from your heart, then the, the the element of the blues is in there with the truth, and that's comes out in her playing, in her expression. Yeah. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to play, or? Um, maybe. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you have anything? Sure. Um, we listened to a bit of um, uh, we listened to a bit of this album Twilight of hers from that came out in 1989. Uh, yesterday, we listened to this piece called Skin. Um, and it might be worth playing again in the context we're in now because it has a bit of this, which is to say that she sort of situates a certain um, embodied experimentalism or uh, a certain way of, uh, I don't want to say attacking the piano, but kind of uh, approaching it with a certain ferocity or volcanic energy. Was that uh, What was the word that... Terry Lynn used this morning, I think she said, either volcano or tornado or something, <laughs> something I don't want to stand next to. <laughs> but then the, the way that it's uh, actually built into the form of the piece is quite interesting. Um, and to me, I think to all of us, as we listened to it yesterday, it signaled a certain, um, uh, shall we say, level of comfort with that kind of expression. So this is called skin. Uh, I, mean, I think in both of those cases, in your piece, Oliver, and in this piece, what's, what seems to come out of nowhere <laughs> is, uh, is that this kind of, that sort of thing can start and stop on a dime, you know, that it uh, has, um, that it can be, it can exist, it can coexist with form, it can become form, it can delineate form. So it's not, I think the tendency when we talk about experimentalism or the so-called avant-garde is that it's an abandoning of what we normally think of as music or something or as as form or as information or as structure and what I find in working with you and in listening to her in this period and and how that sensibility pervaded everything that she did that there is a rigor to it actually and there's a real clarity of intent and uh, unity that's expressed through it all. That um, it's almost like we have to remind people of that because there's a, there's a tendency to assume that it's just anarchy or something or intemperate behavior of a certain kind. <laughs> um. No, it's always about communication and I'm sure that that was at the top of her list when she was presenting herself and when I'm presenting myself, when everyone at this table is presenting themselves, it's about communication. And the form is there. Yeah. Now, listening to that, it just made me think that I don't, I, I didn't know Jerry, but I don't think she thought about these things in boxes, you know, like 
now I'm playing free, now I'm playing mm -hmm. changes, and you know, now I'm playing in this style or so on and so forth. It was just from her, and she's she's sort of, I think, a pivotal figure in how we're going to move forward with the music and how we see things. So that, um, like, you know, talking, we talked about this last night, but um, Jason just saying, like, you know, he didn't. He'd never really, um, wait, now I'm <laughs> getting lost in my thoughts here. <laughs> what you said about, uh, when we were at the, after the concert, you mean, what he said about her, um, about him realizing uh, how influential she had been on this particular point, right? Yeah, yeah, and then it just took, it just broke down the barriers for him yeah. in terms of um, how he saw music and improvisation. And of course, that influences you know everyone that's around him and us, our students, and and the other musicians um, that we work with. So I don't know. I think she's, as time goes by, she's going to play a bigger part in how we see these sort of boxes in music and tearing that down. That it's just improvisation and, and it's it's music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can you know we've talked a little bit about. Um, her various affiliations with people as associated with the avant-garde or with a, an experimental music identity or tradition or even the tag that's been put on them, like Ornette Coleman, like Mr. Lake at times, uh, Joseph Jarman is another one, uh, Dewey Redman, Frank Lowe, she's on an early Frank Lowe album. Uh, so those are people who might have been associated with that tag but then you also hear how th those ideas and those sensibilities and those aesthetics kind of get woven into her overall sensibility and her project and how they then influence the rest of us uh, the fact that um, there is a space for that sensibility in this music whether you use the the j word as the tag <laughs> or um, or creative music or uh, just that there's there's space to take risks and to explore and to um, and to be in the moment. The other side of it, to me, of this term experimental, if we're going to um, stick with it for at least another half hour, <laughs> um, is uh, or maybe let's say twenty minutes, uh, is her way of juxtaposing uh, materials and sensibilities from different what seem like disparate uh, positions or different strategies or different aesthetics. Um, and that could be seen in her incorporation of technology. Like um, there's this piece called Wood. Uh, this is an example from the same record. Um, Here, for example, that these electronic timbres are being blended into what would otherwise be a, an acoustic context, uh, but in a way that's kind of, again, fearless and sort of unbothered is the word I keep using <laughs> to describe what she does. But then also, if, if you were here this morning, um, you heard and saw some clips of her working with a tap dancer um, and just saying like, well, this is, this is what we're doing now. Like we're, this is a band with a tap dancer in it. And I defy you to find more records of that kind in the last century of recorded music of bands with tap dancers in them on the record. I mean, except as a novelty, but not as like the sort of, like a core member of a band that tours and is on every song. Like it's not just like, oh, now we're doing our tap dance number. It's really like, no, we're gonna build repertoire, you know. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then um, I also think of her uh, 
Stu you know, her pieces with Carrie Mae Weems that we experienced a bit of yesterday and that we'll maybe speak a bit about more later this afternoon. Uh, so the experimental sensibility, which is one of roving across disciplines and across sort of the conventional boundaries that we associate with the genre or the tradition or something like that. I remember, we were remembering this time um, in the early 2000s at John Zorn's old club Tonic, Jerry Allen was scheduled to do a solo performance. And I said, wow, that almost never happens. So let me go check this out. And then it turned out that she had decided to have a comedian open for her. <laughs> and, uh, were you was he, were you there? Do you remember this? No, no, I didn't remember. Yeah, this was just not so. I mean, it was maybe two thousand two or so, and she and she introduced it by saying, "Okay, well, this is what this is how it used to be. That um, it was a tradition that we were actually part of the same system and the same culture, and you know, and so we want to see what it's like to bring that back. But this guy wasn't like a traditional comic. I mean, he was." pretty raw and so it was kind of like a little bit of a shock to the system even in tonic which has <laughs> which was seen as an experimental music venue to have something like that this kind of what's a, a, a unexpected stunt that was pulled on all of us you know do you remember that yes <laughs> I don't remember the guy's name but it was uh that was so that's to me is another like if we use that tag as a I mean that's in a way experimental without in a way that even ex exceeds the frame of experimental music. She said it was her cousin. Oh my gosh. It was, it was Jerry's cousin or your cousin? It was James. Ah, ah, it was in the family then. I see. So um, that even makes it more of an interesting <laughs> surprise that it's... It's um, experimental yet familiar, and part of the tradition too, part of the history. She was fearless. It sure was. <laughs> uh, maybe we could open it up to some questions about this. Yes, Mr. Gates. Uh, I was thinking. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Angola. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about um, regional influence, when, when the subject that you brought up in terms of North Carolina and then Detroit <laughs> and, of course, Harlem. But they're all kind of regions within regions. Exactly. For example, uh, George Lewis, Dwight Andrews, Anthony Davis, Paul Maddox, who became Farone yeah. Akloff. That's New Haven, right? We were all New Haven together. Yes. Three of us lived in the same building. Right. I remember one night, you know, we were all drinking or smoking pot or something, and, and Tony Davis was talking about how you signify a beat and implying a beat. And a little bit later, I wrote The Signifying Monkey. Oh. You know, I mean, you would never know these histories. Right. But um, then Dwight had a band, of course, and he, all these guys were coming in. And then you had Middletown, Wesleyan, too, because they were going back and forth. And wasn't Leo Smith there at the time, too? What, huh? Wasn't Leo Smith around there? Oh, yeah, and um, Nat Adderley. Nat was oh. our undergraduate student in Afro-Am and then went up along with... Um, What's, oh my God, he would kill me if I forgot his name, but he married um, David Dinkins' daughter. Um, Jay Hogarth. Jay. Oh. Yeah, we were all there together. We were all listening to music, talking shit, you know, getting high, <laughs> eating fried chicken, and being Yaleys, you know? Uh, so that there are, I don't know how you write about those circles within circles, those right. confluences, but they're real, and they're they very, very meaningful. And, and they're cross-disciplinary. Sure. Nobody would associate me with Pharaoh Nakloff. But he was a very close friend of mine. I will now. <laughs> you will now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mention it to him next time we play together. Uh, well, that's the thing. Is, um, I, the phrase I used earlier is Homi Baba's phrase, affective histories. Because that's what we're talking about, is how we affect and are affected by one another in ways that escape the archive, right? Escape, the, escape documentation. And... Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. See, that's why we're here today, <laughs> is to lodge this in, uh, in the archives so that we can uh, try to make sense of it all. Um, and this is about kind of bringing nuance to our contemporary understandings of even the last 50 years, right? Because there's a lot that's happened in this period that, uh, I mean, Jerry Allen is that, you know, represents the, the summit of so many of these um, historical 
trends and forces, but uh, as we see, it runs really deep, and there are many different layers and avenues and tributaries to mix every possible metaphor. Um, any other comments or questions? Or I'd just like to, to, to add to something that Oliver said about Jerry's experimentalism. I was living in Detroit in the 80s. During the time that you were collaborating with Spencer and Fruk Bay and, mm -hmm. and, um, and that group of musicians who were at the same time developing music with the AACM and other musicians from, uh, from St. Louis. And it's interesting to note that Jerry came as, as broad-minded and ex, as experimental as she was. There was a whole tradition of experimentalism right. that existed in Detroit that actually preceded uh, Jerry. And I think she was a, a benefactor right. of, of what was going on yeah. in Detroit prior to her. Roy Brooks, I remember yes, exactly. seeing Roy Brooks bring his name performing up. with, um, he had a musical saw. Right. that he would perform <laughs> with. And he incorporated basketball yeah. players as a part of his gig uh, in a very serious way. It wasn't shtick at all. It was, it was very much a part of the music making as a part of the experimentation and, and the improvisation. So it's really important to note that she, as a part of that experimental nature, was also, as, as we talked about earlier, as you talked about earlier today, she was a part of the tradition, right? A, a different kind of tradition, but a tradition nonetheless that uh, should be noted. Yes, exactly. And that, that's part of what I see is this kind of um, these different regional formations, shall we say, where uh, there are certain, maybe we can tease out a certain set of practices that seem to kind of spring up in multiple locations, but are all sort of versions of one another, which have to do with uh, a certain self-determination self ethos, right? That's at the heart of it that leads people to form these organizations that then allow them to build something, you know, a power stronger than itself, right? The, to build something that's more than the sum of the individuals uh, that had to do with, you know, so we could talk about these music collectives, but there's also like soul jazz records in Detroit um, we mentioned Horace Tapscott, but that was also basically a collect a musicians collective on the West Coast, uh, Ogma, right? Underground music what, uh, and artists ascension, right? Something like that. <laughs> they, they, they added an A and changed the yeah. They they um, but uh, and even in New Haven, I mean, what I associate with that whole group of folks that you're mentioning that you were a part of is uh is an ethos of um, collaboration, experimentation, uh, con and conversation, and building something. So it's interesting to see all of these practices emerging coterminously in different places. Just as a footnote, you think of it in musicological terms, but we'd all hang out on the week, like Friday night or Saturday night, and go. Um, hear someone gig, then Sunday we'd go to the black church at Yale and Dwight Andrews would preach. Exactly. With a whole different aesthetic. Right. Dwight, my first married, Dwight married me and baptized both my children. <laughs> I think I was married, legally. <laughs> <laughs> I never, when I got there divorced, we, I was hoping that maybe it hadn't been effective, but. Ah, uh, layers within layers. <laughs> layers within layers. I thought you left. Sorry, we've got we've got witnesses now. Uh, I just wanted to um, the other co connection here. We were talking earlier about how one of the things that brings us together is that the people, the people were crossing boundaries. That people were not saying, okay, we're this category, we're going to stay in this category. And I, I think the literary connection with this is also really, really um, important going back into the 19, uh, going back into the 1960s and the idea that, that creating this kind of experimentalism had a political import. Um, 
And it's, it always seemed to me that Jerry had all of that yeah. and, um, and used it to sort of articulate what gets called an experimental sound, but also parts of the tradition, also parts of um, popular music. And I don't actually have a punchline to that. It's just that I want you know, any more thoughts people have about the meaning of being experimental in, at different points in time. Well, I think it's interesting to put that in the context of what Don Byron was saying earlier today, which is that um, basically there was a certain rhetoric that emerged in the 80s that eclipsed, that served to eclipse or marginalize all of those tendencies, right? And uh, instead to say, this is, the tradition is this. When really, as we, as we see from this conversation, the tradition is all of these things. It is a tradition. I mean, it is something that keeps recurring, that spans generations. I mean, because even what we think of as the bebop era, which we might now call the jazz tradition, is simply another iteration of this same dynamic, isn't it? I mean, that's what it is. Uh, so, so now we can see the history of jazz as an, uh, almost an echoic um, and polyvocal formation of this same tendency. And not to essentialize it, but to see how the same tendency can multiply and have all these diverse manifestations and see that as the tradition. What do you all think? Is that fair? <laughs> Let me know if I'm speaking out of pocket here. No, you're right on course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it goes back to what I said earlier, that there's no separation in what we do and what the, the true innovators have always used that concept, that there was no separation. So that's how they moved to the next level or how they came up with different ideas and incorporated that into what they were doing in the past. So the music has to move forward and generations have proved that. And I, my generation and the generation after me are all doing the same thing, moving the mu music forward. Well, I think it's, um, I feel like I've learned something even in the course of, I mean, trying to tease out these, uh, these ideas. And I have to say that it's because of Jerry Allen that we're able to tell this story in a larger way. Like, let's retell the history of jazz in this way, as a history, as a history of collectives, a history of communities, a history of collaborations, a history of cross-disciplinary experimentation. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do that. Sounds good. <laughs> uh, perhaps, yeah, why not? Please. <laughs> I had just one thing building off the, the Roy Brooks thread that I think is relevant, that um, uh, not only was he a musician that was interested in expanding the language of jazz, like you could say he was experimental for sure, uh, but also he was interested in connecting the dots uh, between music coming out of the African diaspora. And I, I vaguely remember that he had a, a, an ensemble devoted to uh, music from indigenous uh, groups in the United States yes. too. Yes. Um, and that if, you know, he was a big mentor figure to, to Professor Allen, and I'm sure that, that and, you know, relating also to the fact that she chose to, to get a degree in ethnomusicology instead of moving to New York right away, right. That, this, that, that all of this really played a role, or it was clearly something that was very important to her, even though I didn't get the chance to, to ask her about it, but that's the subtext, I think, for me. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, people who were with her at Howard, and um, maybe is any of them in the room, is AJ still here? Or, um, or Greg Tate can speak on this too. Uh, is, you know, she was a scholar, she was interested in the humanities and the social sciences, and, so to, and that was because she wanted to situate the music in that way, in a larger context, so that she could understand the why of it and the how of it and then more capably imagine possible futures for it and that's that was even apparent to hear greg tate tell it that was apparent 
in the practice room as an undergraduate. Like she still, she already had that, you know. Um, so that's kind of what we're figuring out here and what we're, what we're gradually coming to terms with, so. Yes, Michael. Well, two things briefly. Uh, one, just to follow up on that uh, and to uh, pick up from our conversation earlier about Jerry as an educator. What you're talking about, her devotion to looking at the music as part of a, a larger humanities and, 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 and human framework uh, was what made her so amazing as the head of our program at Pittsburgh, because as a lot of people know, our, we have the only PhD program that focuses not just on performance, jazz performance, but also on jazz scholarship, and really writing these kinds of, of big picture histories that Jerry was so invested in. Uh, that's what makes it so challenging now as we're searching for a new director to find someone with, with that same sort of scope and experience. and, and uh, uh, it's a challenge. Uh, the other thing I, I, I wanted to, to pick up on was, was maybe, uh, I wondered if you could pull at the thread more about intergenerationalism uh, as a part of what Jerry did and as a part of her brand of experimentalism, if there's a connection between that, um, especially in terms of viewing Jerry's entire career arc, first as someone who was, who was coming in as uh, a, a young gun who was playing with, with the generations before her, like Mr. Lake, uh, and then later like Ornette Coleman, but then there's someone later on becoming an elder who was bringing in people like Kassa overall and, and Maurice Chestnut. And, and, um, and I think there's a tradition in jazz of, of using those intergenerationalisms, even as there is a continuum, when there is a break, that, that act of bringing in new voices and, and voices from different generations to create new challenges and new, new points of departure um, that seems like part of what she was engaged with. And I wondered, uh, especially Mr. Lake, if you have any thoughts about uh, 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 those sorts of connections. Well, creating new partnerships and creating excitement from working with younger musicians who may have some uh, influence on what you're doing and she was open to that, and my cohorts and myself have always done that, bring in younger, younger musicians to get some inspiration from. And it's a two-way street, and so it's definitely intergenerational. You know, it's funny because the model for how to become a jazz musician today is to go to jazz school, but that's not how it worked before, I mean, before the 70s even, right? So not even that long ago, the model, the path was apprenticeship, basically, right? It was um, being part of an intergenerational system that nurtured you and carried you to that point where you were able to express yourself. Uh, it didn't come out of nowhere, and it didn't come from an institution that had a name on it that belong to some British dude from 400 years ago. <laughs> it, uh, you know, it came from community. That's what that was. And um, I mean, this is one of the things that I've experienced um, being in intergenerational contexts as a, as a young musician and, then, and even now as a middle-aged musician, uh, working with people 30 years older than me and 30 years younger than me at the same time even, you know, and, um, and realizing that there is this, I mean, that's, Craig spoke to this yesterday when he was talking about almost like, uh, he experienced it physically as a spiritual connection between McCoy Tyner and Jerry Allen and himself. So those are people who span 30 years uh, and who were in the same room, you know, and, and that was a, so that's the sort of thing, I guess, that we're talking about, right? And I think the way that things have been spun into, an, into the conservatory model, which was never, it was never the, the right model for music of any kind, to be honest, classical or otherwise. It was never really the right way to do it, because the right way to do it was in the context of audiences, right? I mean, that's how I learned how to play, was playing, I remember, do you know, there was a club in New Haven called Malcolm's? Was it there? I don't know how long it was there, but when it was there, when I was there, 
a quarter century ago when I, uh, I started playing in town, when I, you know, and that was when I first experienced the possibility that I could take a solo and someone in the audience would actually be feeling it enough that they'd answer back to me, phrase by phrase, like I was talking to them, you know. That was to me, as a 19, 20 year old, a revelation. Because nobody had ever told me that that was what was actually happening in this music. Because that's not something you access in the scholastic system, right? I mean, you've had that, I'm sure you've... Yeah, totally. So, so I don't know. I mean, I, somehow, that's part, that's part of the puzzle too, is that it's not just about learning from elders, it's learning from everyone in the room. Miss... Of course, yes. But it's the same people, it's just the night before. It's, we're just talking about 12 hours earlier, right? <laughs> hey, Mr. Allen. Yes, um, so, so Vijay, that was Jerry's, one of Jerry's biggest concerns, that, it, that quite frankly, that it, 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 it won't be the Academy, or that it shouldn't be the Academy, it's the ultimate um, transition of this music from generation to generation. It's like the fear, quite frankly, in all due respect, is that the academy is the challenge. Because what it takes to get into the academy is not always where the music lives. And um, the further we get away from where the music lives and the layers that we place in between where the music lives and how it grows, which includes SATs, um, GREs, GMATs, tenure, all those things <laughs> actually create huge barriers between the actuality of the music. And so Jerry was always looking for the opportunity. That's why whenever she came to, to like visit me um, at, at my institution, she was like, where's my chance to go into the community and play with the kids? You know, and quite frankly, I've been a part of institutions that, um, for the archive, mm -hmm. um, are, weren't that open to it. There was like a very high cost to doing that, mm -hmm. you know? It, it was made difficult. And I still think that's prevalent today. So I, I only throw this out because we, I think we have to find a way for the, for, for the academy to embrace the opportunity to allow the music to come through without a lot of the constraints that are currently a part of this perpetuation because the academy is, quote unquote, the knowledge creation institution across the world. I mean, who are we condoning as the next providers of, of this culture? Mm. Okay. <laughs> For real. Mount Allen. In, in case you don't know, that was Jerry Allen's brother, Mr. Mount Allen. Uh, you know, this is the, when I think of, we've been speaking a lot about Jerry Allen's humility. And to me, this is where it comes from, is this sense that, okay, yeah, I'm a professor, and she was, but she knew that a lot of her knowledge came from people who wouldn't be let in the front door, you know? And that's the sort of uh, question we have to always ask ourselves when we talk about this music in this context. Is, uh, um, it's not about whether the music was accessible, aesthetically speaking, but whether people have access to it. And that's, to me, like an ongoing concern as an artist in the world and as a teacher and as part of this community that um, we all have to face. Uh, we're running short of time. I don't know if there's any other burning questions to ask or if we can take a little breath. I can say one Okay. I thought it, when Jerry came to Harvard, um, I think it was about 2006 or 2007, and we started to talk about doing it. And she was very insistent that we do a community concert. And I hadn't thought of it before. But the process of being encouraged to do that made me reach out to Philip Brooks House and to other things. And we set it up. And it was something that was very satisfying for us as well. 
and, and it worked very well. And it, she was able to reach two audiences on that, the kids and then, they, then the Harvard context. And I think with the Academy opening up to this music a little bit, and I feel like my career has been a part of that. Sure it has. And part of that is convincing music departments to think differently about what music is, what training is, and to, you know, to have actual performers on the faculty. And I felt when Jerry took that job at Pittsburgh, I thought, fantastic, we're going to have allies all over the country around this. Um, and the depth to which she understood what the platform was and what it might enable her to do was, was another thing I just totally respected about her. And so I think those of us who are in positions in academia, we need to make sure that the plate stays open and that we have a constant influx of like events like this where performers and academic people inside and outside the institution are speaking to one another. facilities as well. Uh, when she would come to visit her brother here, her father's in a facility, she would make her rehearsal at his home where he lived and the seniors would come to hear the concert as they mm. She would go out to uh, senior places and do concerts for the elder and she enjoyed that a lot because she always felt that she should give back. And she also thought in going to the children that this is the manner in how you, and I believe that because we both got this strongly from Betty Carter. Mm -hmm. yes. How do you build an audience to right. start with the youth? And it's simple. It is. But it's hardly ever done. You know, that to me is part of the tradition too, is all of those things you mentioned, that sensibility of, um, making contact, uh, that sense of responsibility is another phrase that's been um, invoked more than once, uh, to um, not leave anyone behind and not forget. And uh, you know, I, when I lived in Oakland in the 90s, I was part of this group called the African Roots of Jazz. It was led by this drummer named E.W. Wainwright who played with McCoy Tyner and Pharaoh Sanders. and. Uh, we played in the prisons in the state of California. That was our main gig, was playing in the maximum security wards for basically 98% black and Latino, um, as he called them, political prisoners. So, I mean, that, and that, to me, I remember Andrew Hill worked, taught in prisons for many years, and, uh, you know, um, so, the, and I also remember that one of the most pivotal experiences in my childhood was that Garth Fagan's dance company came to my elementary school when I was five. And I'll never, I remember it now, 40 years later, as like one of the, maybe one of the reasons I'm an artist, you know? So that's the kind of thing that, uh, I see that as part of this same assemblage of traditions, this collection of things that we can call tradition, or that we can call experimentalism too, because maybe they're the same thing. All right, we'll take a break. We'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you.